Hello Saints, if you're hearing this, that means you're watching on our local Kojiko TV station. Um, and this is a special message just for you. Our partnership with Kojiko was not something that we solicited. They came to us asking if we wanted to put our program on TV. Um, we had never considered it, so we thought, why not? Yeah. It's been a pretty steep learning curve, and there's much that we still need to learn in order to improve the quality of our pro program. One of the things that we couldn't foresee was how much time it would take to edit the program to put it to air. And up to this point, we've been using a small held hand video recorder at the back of our auditorium, and it's showing some serious signs of wear and tear. So we find ourselves evaluating whether we ought to continue our Kojiko broadcast or not. Part of the difficulty in this dieting is that Kojiko is unable to provide us with statistics as to how many people are watching, and we have no idea if even one person is watching. So I'd like to make an appeal to you who are listening today. If you are watching this program, we'd like you to let us know. You can do that in one of three ways. You can email us at info at nbbc.ca. The email doesn't have to be long, just a line saying I'm watching you on Coach Co would be sufficient. However, if the program has encouraged you specifically and you would like to share that, that would be a great encouragement to us. If you're uncomfortable or don't have access to email, you can phone us at 905-335-5808. Be sure to leave a message in the general mailbox if no one answers. Or finally, you can mail us a letter or a card at North Burlington Baptist Church, 1377 Walker's Line, Burlington, Ontario, L7M, 0 said one Obviously, if we're not reaching people with our program, it would be a poor use of time and resources to invest any further in this way. But beyond just knowing if anybody's watching, I'm wondering if you're in a position and would be willing to support us financially to upgrade our equipment so the program that we produce could be done better. Our desire as a church is to reach our community with the good news of God's kingdom, and I'm wondering if you who are benefiting from this program might join us in that mission and support us to improve the tool that has benefited you. If you can find opportunity to donate on our website at mbbc.ca, that would be fantastic, or you can contact us by mail or phone. Be sure to note that your gift is in response to the Coach Co broadcast so that we can utilize it accordingly. Thanks for taking time out of your day to join us through this program. Grace and peace to you in Jesus' name. And uh, we are here to worship the one who became obedient to death, even death on a cross, uh, the one who has shown us the way of being a servant and putting the needs of others ahead uh, of his own. And uh, we, we want to do that. One of the things that, uh, just as we come uh, to worship together today, that strikes me about the Lord is, is that... Uh, he didn't come for the elite or the special. He came for everyone. I love the fact that he ate with taxpayers and sinners, and people murmured and said, "What is he doing?" You know, and because he knew that it's it's not the sick who need a doctor, or it's not it's not the healthy that need a doctor. It's the sick, and he came to each one of us. Us we who are sinners and and died for us while we were yet sinning so let's stand together and let's offer our hearts in worship to the lord there's a voice that must be heard there's a song that must be sung there's a name that must be lifted high there's a treasure more than gold there's a king upon the throne there is one whose praise will fill the skies his name is Jesus, friend of sinners. Jesus, Jesus, friend of mine. There 
there's a peace that calms our fears. There is a love stronger than death. There is a hope that goes beyond the grave. There is a friend who won't let go. There is a heart that beats for you. There is one name by which we are saved. His name is Jesus, friend of sinners. Jesus, Jesus. Glorify your name. We glorify your 
throne of praise unto you alone let our voices raise you are seated on a throne of praise unto you alone let our voices raise we glorify your name we glorify
to be. How great Thou art, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. Lord, all of us, we just say amen to how great you are, and we just bless you, Lord, that, uh, Lord, that you welcome us into your presence by the blood of your Son, the one who gave his life for us, and, uh, and God, it is so good to be here offering you our worship as individuals, but Lord, corporately as a group, just putting our hearts together and lifting up the name of Jesus. Lord, we come to you acknowledging that uh, it's a good thing that you are the friend of sinners because that is in our lives and no matter what we seem to do, uh, we continue to, uh, to sin. And we just thank you, God, that, uh, that you give us forgiveness. But Lord, our desire is to know you and to, to know you in a deeper, deeper way. And Lord, I have to admit that the many times when I feel that I know you, I just find things about you that I did not know and, uh, and maybe things about myself that I wouldn't want to but need to. But Lord, we know this, that you love us, that you love us deeply. And uh, we're here, Lord, to return that to you in Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated. I'm going to ask the uh, ushers to come forward and take the uh, offering up this morning. And if you are visiting with us today, please don't feel obligated to give. And uh, those of us that are regulars, let's give with a glad and generous heart.
Saints. So, um, on days like today, don't you just feel like snuggling up with a nice warm bowl of soup? Because you can, because after this we're having our soup and sandwich uh, and uh, our deeper at MBBC classes, and uh, no, so you can snuggle with the bowl of soup, uh, just don't spill it on your lap. And, uh, and so I want to encourage you, uh, for those who have signed up, to uh, be promptly at your classes with your soup and sandwiches at quarter to 12, and you'll be done by one. I want to introduce Annabelle Robinson. She's going to stand up, just wave around. We won't make her do a dance or anything. Just <laughs> She's teaching the, uh, the course, uh, uh, um, Knowing the Bible for All It's Worth. And then Steve Bedard is continuing uh, doing his series on the uh, cults and sex education. That's S-E-C-T-S. And uh, he's going to be preaching today. So this is actually uh, an introduction to Steve. Um, but I, I just want to, you know, uh, two weeks ago I was sitting with a friend. And he had just gotten back from Amsterdam. He was telling me that in Amsterdam, uh, he was with Christian leaders, that the conversation about God doesn't exist. Like, you, you can talk to someone and say something about God, but they won't even engage a conversation. God is no longer something people are even willing to consider. At least here, you can debate it with, with people. But there, it's not even a conversation. Um, and then he was telling me about how in Canada... Uh, a leader of a major uh, denomination was saying to the press, what we really need to do as a church is to get God out. If only God wasn't part of the church, maybe more people would come. The real problem is God in the church. Now, he was being serious. That's not funny. That's tragic. And I couldn't help but wonder if, if what we saw this week is in part a result of what I heard from my friend a couple weeks ago, that when we begin to say, God, we don't want to, he begins to say, okay, I'll leave. And I'll leave you to your own vices, your own destruction, your own ways, your own evil. And the funny thing is that when that happens, we'll shake our fist at God and blame him. Anyways, um, now is the time for the people of God to stand up more, to speak out louder, to stand straighter and firmer in their convictions and to not shrink back. And so um, I am so thrilled that we have these classes to educate you and equip you and Steve, I'm glad you're here, and he's going to fire you up with some message. I have no idea what it's about, but it's going to be good, because Steve is smart as well as good-looking. And so even if you don't understand what he's saying, he's fine to look at. That's what his wife told me. And uh, so I want to welcome you here, Steve, come on up and uh, share God's Word. When do you want your check? Well, it's wonderful to uh, to be here with you, and I want to thank you for your prayers. And the prayers I'm talking about are specifically your prayers uh, for the Canadian Forces. Uh, you may not realize that I'm a uh, a chaplain with uh, the Army Reserves, and I was on a Canadian Forces base uh, during both attacks in uh, in St. John and in uh, in Ottawa, and uh, it's hit us hard to. Uh, to hear these things happening just as we're walking around uh, the base realizing that any time uh, something could happen to us. So I would ask that you, uh, you pray for the Canadian Forces, uh, pray for the families, and uh, pray for... Um, also, Remembrance Day is coming up very soon. There's going to be a lot of, of, uh, of Canadian Force uh, personnel in uniform, in public places, and uh, it's going to be a frightening time. We just don't know uh, what can happen. So please uh, pray for uh, the Canadian Forces and their families. It's very important. And also for the, the chaplains. We have uh, an incredible opportunity to be there to support uh, the soldiers in uh, emotional and in spiritual ways. So I would really ask that, uh, that you do that. Our passage this morning is from Acts chapter 17, and I'm going to be reading verses 16 to 34. And, and the translation I'm going to read from is the English Standard Version, but you can follow along in any translation. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day and with those who happened to be there, some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with them. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? 
Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the heaven and everything in it, being the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God in the hope that they might feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man, the times of ignorance God overlooked. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. But others said, We will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst. But some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dion Dionysus the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this passage. We thank you for the ministry of the Apostle Paul. And we ask that you would guide us through this message, that your spirit would speak to our hearts and minds, and that we would know what this means for us today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I grew up in uh, St. Catharines, and one of the, the memories that I have about St. Catharines was a place that we used to visit, and it was called the Bridge to Nowhere. And it literally was a bridge to nowhere. Uh, basically, you would go there, and this was this beautiful bridge, and you'd go up the, the steps, and then you'd come to the, uh, the top part, and then you'd go down the steps to this little platform where there was nowhere to go. The only thing you could do was turn around and go back up the steps, onto the platform and then down the steps again. That's all it was. It was simply a bridge for you to go up and down. It never did take you to anywhere. And as I would go up and down that bridge, I thought, why would the city spend money on a bridge like that? Were they thinking that people just enjoyed walking on a bridge, that they didn't care if they were going somewhere? And then I realized I had gone up and down that bridge a number of times, and perhaps they were right. They had spent their money, perhaps, in a good way. But as I, as I reflected on that, it made me think of the experience of the church. In some ways, we build a church, or we build a bridge to nowhere. And by that, what I mean is we can develop our theology very precisely and have everything absolutely correct. We can put together a beautiful worship service with the best music, with uh, very eloquent prayers, uh, with uh, uh, interesting uh, sermons, all of those things. We could put together a beautiful package, and yet once we get over the bridge, we look around and there's no one there. We haven't connected with our community or with our society. I think back to the good old days. Now, I'm old enough to remember a, a generation when, when things were different than what they are today. Uh, I remember a time when everyone had the Christian vocabulary. Now, of course, uh, even uh, when I was a, a child, not everyone attended church, but they at least 
were a part of the church culture. They, they understood the words. They understood the stories. Uh, they might even identify as Christians. Uh, they would probably go to church on Christmas and on Easter. And so it was easy to communicate to the people around us. Probably our neighbors would be people very much like we were. But today, things have changed. We're not the same. When you talk to your neighbors, you might find that they are indeed a churchgoer. Or you might find that they are an atheist. Or you might find that they are someone with an eclectic spirituality, taking from here and there and everywhere. Or you may find that your neighbor belongs to another religion, one of the major religions of the world. You can't know. How do we connect with such a culture? How do we build that bridge so that we can communicate with them in effective ways? What we don't want to do is to build a bridge to nowhere. We want to build a bridge to somewhere. Now, there are some people who have looked at the situation, who have looked at the changing culture around us, and have said that we need to completely reinvent the church, or even worse, and this is something uh, really that, that Merv was talking about, to reinvent the gospel. As if, if we changed all of these things that are important to us, that somehow the people in the culture will respond and will be able to have that connection. Well, not only is that absolutely wrong, it's also completely unnecessary. The things that we see in the culture around us and the, the, the dynamic of the different religions, this isn't new to the 21st century. This was going on in the first century. And the Bible provides us a very clear outline on how we can connect with the people around us. And, and that's what we're going to, to take a look at. So the first step that we want to do, if we, if we want to build this bridge to the culture around us, is to do our homework. We need to do some investigation. Now, as I was preparing for this, I, I was thinking about an experience I had when I was uh, going to school at Brock University. And I was taking a, uh, a course, and I gotta be honest with you, I just did not care about this course. I wasn't enjoying it. I actually didn't even need the credit. And it just was not connecting with me at all. And so I had an assignment that I had to do. It was actually a presentation that had to be made. And not only did I not prepare ahead of time, I didn't even prepare the night before. How about that, eh? That's, that's horrible. I, first of all, I want to assure you, I have prepared this sermon. This is not something that I'm making up uh, as I'm going along. But anyway, so, so I showed up for, for school that day, and I had a course, or I had a class, right before the one that I had to do the presentation. So I just casually uh, asked some of my friends, hey, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? And then I put something together, and it was, you know, it was horrible. I, I, I didn't do good at all. And um, I'm embarrassed to say that I just wasn't doing my homework. And that is not the way to go about building a bridge. We need to be prepared. I'll make another confession, because I believe this is a safe place for us to, to talk, do this. And I don't know if, uh, if Pastor Murf has ever uh, had this nightmare, but I had a recurring dream where I would show up at church thinking it was just a, um, a weekday that I'm coming into the office to do my work, and I realize it's Sunday morning. And the sanctuary is, is full of people, and uh, no songs have been picked, uh, no sermon has been prepared, no Bible passage has been picked or anything like that. And I just walk into the sanctuary and they're all looking at me like, okay, put on a service. And I don't know if you've had that dream or not, or if this is my, just my own issues. It sounds like it's just my own issues. But <laughs> this is the, some of the, the things that, that go on uh, in my mind. I want to be prepared. I want to have those things together. Well, Paul was someone who did his homework. And the passage we looked at we see a number of things. First of all, we see that he toured Athens. He went around the city, and he looked at their temples. He looked at the statues they had. Uh, he, he understood these things. Probably in his, uh, his own uh, time of, of uh, growing up in Tarsus, which was a, uh, a city uh, known for its Greek culture, uh, he probably had taken time there to learn. He probably had read some of the Greek literature. So, uh, Paul was very educated in these ways. He knew what their religious beliefs were about. He took that time to be not a critic, but a student. And if we want to interact with the people around us, we have to take that time to be a student. I, I have heard uh, Christians who have had well-meaning plans to interact with people of another religion, 
and yet they did it out of ignorance, and it just shut down the conversation. For example, uh, someone who would want to, to speak to a Muslim, and he would uh, accuse the Muslim of worshipping Muhammad. Now, as soon as you accuse a Muslim of worshipping Muhammad, you have ended that conversation. There is nothing more that can happen. First of all, it's wrong, it's completely ignorant. Secondly, it's completely offensive to them. So uh, you have to do your homework. You have to learn what does your neighbor believe. Uh, is your neighbor a Jehovah Witness? Are, are they a Muslim? Are they an atheist? Find out what they believe. Now, you might be thinking, well, you know, I don't have the education. Uh, I haven't taken the classes. Well, uh, if you haven't taken the classes, you should be taking the class with me as we're going through these uh, different groups. A <laughs> little bit of, a, of a, an ad here. But you know what? It's actually really, really easy. You don't have to have a university degree. Uh, you don't have to spend hours and hours uh, studying on the internet, although all of those things are very helpful, and, and I would encourage them. You can just sit down with someone of a different worldview and say, tell me about what you believe. And it works really, really well. In the, uh, the training that I'm doing uh, in, in the military right now, my roommate is a Jewish rabbi. Well, you know what? It is a lot of fun. I just ask them question after question after question. It does two things. One, it increases my knowledge. Number two, it develops our relationship. So we're getting closer to each other. We're becoming more friends uh, through this conversation. It really is a win-win situation. And you can do that with anyone. So I'd encourage you uh, to do that. Now, some people would look at that and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Jesus said in the Gospels to not prepare anything just to wait for the Holy Spirit to give us what we need to say. Well, you're going to have to look at that in context. That is not what uh, Jesus is saying. Nowhere does he say uh, never to learn or never to, to grow and to develop. Uh, he wants us to do those things. That particular passage is simply, if you're thrown in a place where you're being persecuted and uh, you're put on trial, to not be anxious that it's all on your own strength, that the Holy Spirit will help you in those times. That's what it's about. It never is an excuse to, uh, to not prepare. I, I teach at a Bible college, and if any of my students came and said, well, uh, I didn't study because I, I was waiting for the Holy Spirit to show up, and he didn't show up, so I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, that wouldn't go over well at all. So that, that first step is for us to do our homework, to, to do a little bit of study. The second part is to analyze. It's really to to think critically. Now, when I say critical, I don't mean uh, that you're, you're trying to tear apart things and to, to say bad things to the person. Uh, what I mean by critical is you're learning, you're hearing this information, but you're working through it in your mind, you're comparing it to what the scriptures have to say, uh, you, you're looking for uh, what is the real meaning behind what they're saying. I'll give you an example uh, for us. As a, as a father, uh, we, we, first of all, we have, uh, we have five children. And when they come to us and they say something, I don't just go by what they say. There is no way that I'm just going to go by the things that they say. When they say something to me, like, did you do something? And they say, no. I'm looking for uh, eye contact. Are they actually looking at me? Uh, what is their, their body language that they're doing? Is there a mess immediately behind them where they're saying, no, I didn't do anything? So I'm thinking critically, right? I'm not just taking their words at face value. Well, that's the kind of thing uh, that we need to do as well. In the passage we're looking at, uh, Paul is learning. He's walking through the temples. He's seeing the idols and all of those things. But it also says that in his heart, he was offended by it. That he looked at these idols and he knew that that did not fit with what he understood about the God of the Bible, that idolatry is completely against what God wanted. So he made that connection. That's what we mean by thinking, uh, thinking critically. We need to uh, be willing to think very carefully about these things. But also, I want you to notice that when Paul is doing this, he's keeping those thoughts to himself. He's not uh, smashing idols or, or uh, doing anything like that, spray painting uh, the, the temples, he's note, making a mental note, this is wrong, and he's going to use it further on in his interaction with them. So we've looked at doing your homework, thinking critically, here's the next part, and this part really has to go with that idea of thinking critically, and that is treating people with respect. Now, Paul could have just uh, jumped in there and said, 
all of you idolaters are going to go to hell. And that's all there is to it. He could have done that, but that's not what he does. He's very careful in what he's doing. He's trying to, uh, to work at building a bridge on a foundation that they have. And that foundation is built on respect. Yes, he is offended by their idolatry, but he wants to do something else. It's more important for him to connect with them than to express his offense. What we see in this passage is that he doesn't affirm them. He doesn't go and say everything is okay, but he finds a way where there's something in common. The way he does that, he goes, I see that in all ways you are very religious. Now, what is he saying there? Is he saying something good? Is he saying something bad? Well, they are religious, right? I mean, they have the wrong religion, but they're at least religious. So he's not lying. He's saying something that's really true. But he's leaving room here. He's not saying, you're good, don't worry. All religions lead to God, no problem. He's not saying that either. So he's gone as far as he can. They are interested in spiritual things. They are interested in God. They're interested in creation, all of those things. That is good. This is a common area from which they can build a, a bridge. We have to ask ourselves, when we're talking to someone of another worldview, why are we talking to them? What is our intent? Well, for some people, it is to express their frustration. Uh, they see someone who believes something that's completely anti-biblical, and they're just filled with emotion, and all they got to do is just vent it. They just want to express how upset they are with this situation. Well, that's understandable. We're human. But you know what? It does no good. It does not help anything at all. What we need to do is to find a way to connect. Our ultimate goal should not be to express anger, but to help the person to see the truth and bring them to a living relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, one of the things I'm very interested in, what, one of my focuses, is that of apologetics. And the, the key verse for apologetics is 1 Peter 3.15. And it talks about the importance of being ready to give uh, a defense for the, uh, the hope that we have within us. And everyone likes to quote that particular part of the verse. But the next part of it says, you do it with gentleness and respect. If you don't do it with gentleness and respect, you're wasting your time. There's no point in even trying to do apologetics. No matter who you're talking to, what worldview, whether they're atheist or they're Hindu or um, Mormon or any particular uh, uh, religious point of view, there is something praiseworthy in there. There is something about their life, there is something uh, about their worldview that is good. And you find that, and you begin to work from there. So Paul has built his foundation. Now he's ready to build the bridge. He's re now, now he's ready to make the connection. And so what needs to happen is not to impose a, a prepackaged presentation of, uh, this is what I'm going to use in every circumstance. Rather, he tailor tailors his presentation based on who they are. So for Paul, what we find is earlier on in the chapter, he goes into a Jewish synagogue. And the kinds of things that he does in the Jewish synagogue is to quote scripture. He'll, he'll uh, go to the, the Hebrew Bible and will say, look at these prophecies, see how Jesus fulfills these prophecies. This is why Jesus is the Messiah, and this is why you need to accept Jesus. That's how Paul interacts with Jewish people. But here in Athens, when he's dealing with these people who, are, are, uh, who have a philosophical background, you'll notice he doesn't quote the Bible at all. He never brings scripture into the conversation. In fact, what he does is he quotes from Greek authors. He quotes from their own poets. Why would he do that? Isn't that wrong? The Bible is our authority. Well, the reason he doesn't quote the Bible is these people don't know the Bible. They don't know anything about the Bible. There is no sense of the Bible having authority. For you to say, well, this is what Isaiah said, they're going to be, well, who's Isaiah? Why should I listen to what Isaiah has to say? So he quotes from their own writings. He brings up the, uh, the altar to the unknown God. He says, I saw this altar to the unknown God. Well, let me tell you, this God that is unknown to you, he is known, and I can make him known to you. 
And do you see how he, he uses their own beliefs there to build that bridge? That's what we need to do when we're interacting with our neighbors and with the people we work with and the people we go to school with. Find out what they believe. What do we have in common? Uh, if we believe in a God who is the God of creation, well, let's work with that. If we believe uh, in a faith that talks about a high level of morality, let's start with that. Uh, if we believe in the importance of love, let's start with that. Those are the kind of things that we have to, to work with. We need to find that thing in common, and it's there that we build our bridge. Now, as I conclude, I want to say that there are some Christians who look at what Paul does in Acts chapter 17, and they say, Paul was wrong. What he does in Athens is wrong. It's there to show us the mistakes Paul makes. And the reason why they say it was wrong is because you look at what the reaction is. At the end of the chapter, it says that some believed, uh, some scoffed, and then some people wanted to hear more. They weren't ready to commit. And they said, if it was real, if that was the right way to do this, everyone would have believed. Okay. The problem is, if you look at the parable of the soils from Jesus, what does Jesus say? When the seed goes out, there's different kinds of ground. And some people are going to reject it right away. Uh, some people will grow a little bit, and then they'll fall away. And then there are others who will have who will uh, multiply in fruit. They will, they will embrace the truth of the word. So even Jesus told us not everyone is going to believe what we say. What we want to do as a church is not to build a church to nowhere. We don't want to just do our things and forget about the community and, and, and not care about who we're connecting with. We want to build a church to somewhere. You do that by learning. You do that by thinking critically. You do that by respecting people who are different from us. You do that by building on what we have in common. And when we take all of those things into account, we can build a church to somewhere. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for where you have put us, for the communities that we live in, for the places where we work, uh, for this church and the neighborhood that it is in. We thank you that there are people from different backgrounds and worldviews and religions all around us. Help us to connect. Help us to make a difference. And help us to share Jesus. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. our ability to have an impact in the world that we live in starts with uh, yielding ourselves to the Lord. So let's stand together and uh, as we sing to him, let's say amen in our hearts. I'm giving you my heart and all that is within. I lay it all down. For the sake of you, my King, I'm giving you my dreams. I'm laying down my rights. I'm giving up my pride for the promise of new life. And I
thank you for your Holy Spirit. We know that he has been given to us as a seal and, uh, and Lord, as a comforter. And I just pray that that very spirit of Christ that is in us will find submission, will find hearts that are willing to let go and to let the life of Christ live and shine through us. And Lord, we just bless you for your patience, for your goodness, and we thank you, Lord, that our hope, our hope is found in you. And we know that there's a time when we will see you face to face. And you will not be ashamed of us because of Christ. So in our lives, God, might we never be ashamed of Christ. And may we just proclaim him with great joy. shine with the glory of the Lamb. There's a way we can go there. We can live there beyond time. Because of you. Because of you. Because of your love. Because of your blood. No more pain. No more sadness, no more suffering, no more tears, no more sin, no more sickness, no injustice, no more death because of you, because of you, because of your love, because of your blood. All our sins are washed away, and we can live forever, and now we have this hope because of you. Oh, we'll see you face to face, and we will dance together in the city of our God because of you. There is joy everlasting, there is gladness, there is peace. There is wine ever flowing, there's a wedding, there's a feast because of you. Because of you, because of your love, because of your blood. All our sins are washed away, and we can live forever, and now we have this hope because of you. Oh, we'll see you face to face, and we will dance together in the city of our God because of you. Because of you. Because of you, because of you, because of your love, because of your blood, all our sins are washed away, and we can live forever, and now we have this hope, because of you. So, Steve, I was thinking about your dream that you have of coming on Sunday and, and then realizing that everybody's there and you hadn't prepared. I do have, actually, a name for that Sunday. We call it Open Mic. <laughs> Just put the pressure on them. Actually, talking about uh, Open Mic and sharing testimonies and that kind of thing, uh, 
next Sunday we have two people getting baptized who will be sharing their journey of faith, and so I hope you'll be here ready to celebrate with us. It's going to be a great day, um, and, uh, and I hope that um, you are prepared now uh, to practice what Steve has talked about. Uh, do some learning. Do some educating. I love his idea of just asking someone, well, what do you believe? I find a good follow-up is, why do you believe that? Which normally people then begin to hum and awe about. Most people just stumble into their beliefs. But, friends, this week, this is not just an academic exercise we've done. This is, a, this is something we're meant to live out. That's why each week I do this kind of thing where I try and encourage you as we go out that we live out the message that we've heard. So if you're not engaging with somebody of a different belief that you can learn from, then maybe you need to look around and say, where can I build a bridge? It may be that you're already engaging and you haven't been able to find that thing in common where you can then take the relationship from where it is to introduce them to the good news that you know in a way that they might hear. But friends, this week, think strategically about the bridge you're building into your neighborhoods, into your neighbors, and go in the grace of God and share it with others.